Please remain standing for scripture. We're in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. It's on page 1009 of your ESV Pew Bible. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. God's word is inerrant and infallible. So let's look at it together. Starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Please be seated. I'm just going to let you know something. We're going to run a little late today. Front, okay? uh, we don't do this often, you know, but every once in a while that, it just kind of happens. Uh, between the school commissioning, which I think was a good thing to do today, and I planned an extra song because I wanted to really exalt Christ this morning, we're just running a little long. So I'm just putting it out there. I hope you can give some grace and, and peace this morning um, as, we, uh, as, we, as we engage in God's Word. But if I were to ask you, though, this question, who do you say that I am, what would your answer be? Maybe your answer would be you know, describing me as a pastor or a husband or a dad or a friend. Maybe you'd highlight my love of the Vikings or of coffee. Maybe my dapper appearance the extreme part in my hair, my magnificent beard, might make your list. It doesn't matter how you describe me, though, there'd be one common factor that would be a part of every single person's description, and that would be that I am a human, right? There's no getting around that fact. Even if some worldly ideologies are starting to lie and say that you can identify as other species, I'm not a bird, I'm not a plane, I'm definitely not Superman. I was born, I will live, and I will die a human. But I guess I should clarify an earlier statement. The description of human may be common for 99.9999999 to the billionth nine percent of people, but it's not accurate for Jesus. What was, what is Jesus? Well, when I went to seminary, I learned a whole variety of beliefs about Jesus from different scholars and theologians. And one of the prominent beliefs was from a group of people, a group of historians, who believed that Jesus was just a man. They believed that he was a man that was definitely born during the reign of King Herod. His mother's name was Mary, and he had a human father whose name may or may not have been Joseph. They think he was a wise man who shared meals with outcasts and practiced faith healing, maybe with the uh, assistance of ancient medicine or magic. They reject uh, the, uh, the walking on water and the raising of Lazarus from the dead. They think he was executed for being a public nuisance and don't believe that he rose again. For them, Jesus was a moral teacher and nothing more. Now I contend, I believe, and I have biblical support that this can't be true. I mean, how can it be? If Jesus was only a man, if he was only a great moral teacher, then how could his death forgive our sins? How could he rise again? How could he not be considered crazy when he said that he and God were one? And yet, we do see in God's word that he definitely was a man, he ate, he drank, he slept, he walked. We see descriptions of him being tired and sad and angry and happy. And so let's ask ourselves this question this morning and let's look at the biblical support for our answer and the biblical support for our core Christian belief. Was Jesus just a man? Look at verse 1 with me. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
Now John immediately goes all the way back to the beginning of time and sets the stage at a cosmic level for his description of Jesus as he introduces him. John gives four characteristics in this one verse alone. First, he says that Jesus is the Word. Now, before Christ, God spoke indirectly through creation and directly through the Old Testament Scripture. Both of these reveal uh, who God is. We know of God's power through creation, and we know of his plan of salvation through Scripture. They both reveal God, his character, and his attributes, but they exist apart from God. Calling Jesus the Word is to show that Jesus is the full embodiment of God. He, re he reveals God personally. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3, echoes the beginning verses of John 1. They say, long ago, and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. See, Jesus is God's last word. We will not find God apart from him. But back in John 1, the next characteristic about Jesus was that he is in the beginning. Now, this means that he has an eternal nature. The phrase in the beginning is the exact phrase that opens up the book of Genesis. See, John is establishing a connection between creation, the creation account in Genesis, and his gospel. See, knowing the creation account of Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, we may have expected John to open his gospel saying, in the beginning, God. But instead he says, in the beginning, the Word. See, the focus of this is to show that Jesus was before all things. He was pre-existent. The next characteristic is his fellowship with God. John says that the Word was with God. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus just coexisted with God. No, the idea is that there was an active and an intimate relationship between God and the Word, while also affirming that they were distinct from each other. See, being with God shows that Jesus had a separate personality within the Trinity. So Jesus is eternal and yet distinct from God the Father. And the final characteristic is his divine nature. John says that the Word was God. In the Greek, the translation is interchangeable. It could be God was the Word or the Word was God. This interchangeable nature of the phrase just emphasizes that God and the Word are one and the same. There's no teasing them apart. Jesus is God. This means that uh, everything that can be said about God the Father can be said about God the Son. In Jesus and through him, God the Father is known. And so we see from verse 1 alone that Jesus is the Word, that Jesus is eternal, that Jesus has a distinct personality in the Trinity, and that he is God. Verse 2 summarizes all of this for us. It says, he was in the beginning with God. See, Jesus' full divinity is emphasized. His eternal nature is emphasized. His close relationship with God as part of the Trinity is emphasized. And by restating that Jesus was in the beginning... John demonstrates that Jesus has always been active in revealing God. See, creation reveals God, and Jesus was God's agent of creation. John emphasizes this with verse 3. Look at it with me. It says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now this verse points to creation. Everything owes its existence to the word. John states this first in the positive, and then secondly in the negative. First, he says that everything came into being through the Word. That's the positive. And then in the negative, he says that nothing was created without the Word. See, a more literal translation helps us understand this a little bit better. In the Greek, it says, Without him was made not even one thing that has been made. See, this emphasizes that Jesus created absolutely everything. Now we saw this earlier when I read Hebrews 1, 
But also remember, it was about a year ago that we looked at Colossians 1, verses 15 to 17. And the same thing is stated there. Colossians 1, 15 to 17 says this, He, meaning Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Sounds very similar to Hebrews and John. See, all things, without exception, were made by Jesus. He is supreme over all of it. For, for all of eternity, he was with God, and he is fully and completely God, and he always has been. Jesus is God. That's our first point for today. Jesus is God. And why is this important? Well, it's important for a few reasons. It's important because this means that to know Jesus is to know God. There is no knowledge of God apart from a knowledge of Jesus. This also means that God was always like Jesus. You know, we sometimes think that God was once different in the Old Testament and changed and was a little bit different in the New Testament. But because Jesus is God and, and God is unchanging— we see exactly who God is and always has been. And also, Jesus is God means that he is able to fully satisfy our spiritual needs. God is infinite, and so Jesus is infinite. Out of his uh, infinitude, that's a fun word, out of his eternal nature, he can satisfy us. Jesus is God. This is a fundamental belief of Christianity. It is foundational to our faith, and it is testified throughout the Bible. Jesus is fully man, and he is fully God. The historians I told you about earlier do not know the truth. But there are more people than just them who don't know it. Atheists will reject that Jesus existed or will say that he was just a man. Muslims will say that he was just a prophet. Mormons will say that he was a man who earned his way to godhood. Over and over again, people reject the truth of God's word for something that fits what they want to be real. But the truth of God's word is plain. Jesus is God. He is the word. He is eternal. He is creator. But there's another reason, a very important reason, why this matters. Let's look at what it is. Look at verses 4 to 5. They say, In him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. See, from creation, John now shifts his focus to humanity. But there's a purpose behind it. In Genesis, at creation, the first thing that God created was light. He spoke it into existence. On the fourth day, he created, or separated light from darkness. And on the fifth day and sixth day, he created life. Now, John demonstrates that life and light is in Jesus. He is the source of physical and spiritual life. Because he created all things, Jesus has always been a source of life. But he, is also, uh, he also brings spiritual life through himself. See, we are all dead in our sin. Spiritually, even though we are physically alive, before believing in Christ, we are all spiritually dead. We all have a sin nature. The, the law of God, it sets the standard of perfect righteousness that we need to keep, and we can't keep it. We fall short on a daily basis. But God sent Jesus into the world that we might live through him. Jesus took the punishment we deserve. He, took, he bore our sins unto himself, and he died on the cross. But Jesus is God, and that means that Jesus' death on the cross is very important. He is the only sufficient and acceptable sacrifice for our salvation. And three days later, he rose again. If we confess that he is Lord, if we believe in his death and resurrection, we will be forgiven our sins and be granted eternal life. This is an eternal life, not an earthly life that can be lost. In Jesus is life. He has the ability to give and sustain life forever. This is the gospel. And this life, John says, is light. Only those who have life in Christ are able to walk by the light. 
by this perfect and pure light, we can see the world around us for what it truly is. We can see where it falters and where God is working at it. We're also able to see ourselves as we truly are. We can see our tendency for sin. We can see that we are created in God's image, and we can see our desperate need of his mercy. Jesus is light. He's a light that reveals truth uncorrupted. Darkness, though, will try to corrupt our vision and will pull us away from the light. The word darkness in John 1 verse 5 refers to the world alienated from God. It is blind. It is fallen. It is sinful. It is dominated by Satan. But God, but uh, through Jesus, Jesus is the light that shines and will continue to shine. He exposes the world's darkness. With his coming, the distinction between good and evil, truth and lies, become more clearer. Isaiah prophesied about this when he said, uh, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. See, Jesus is a light that penetrates the darkness. Now John closes verse 5 by saying, And the darkness has not overcome it. Now your translation may interpret the word overcome to mean comprehend or understand. It may say, and the darkness has not understood it. The, the most literal translation of the Greek word here means to seize or to apprehend. And so a more literal translation would be, and the darkness has not seized it or apprehended it. Now if we interpret that Greek word physically, then we would translate it as it has not overcome it or overtaken it. If we translate it intellectually, then we would say the darkness has not comprehended or understood it. Both of these translations are correct. The darkness certainly does not understand the light, and it certainly cannot overcome the light either. Jesus is life and light, and only those who step out of darkness are able to have a relationship with him. Salvation is found in Christ alone. That's our second point for today. Salvation is found in Christ alone. It can't be found anywhere else. There is no one else who ever existed that was both God and man. There is no one else who could ever bridge that gap. Men have tried for 4,000 or so years before Christ, and for 2,000 or so years after Christ, people have tried. But each and every one of them have failed. It is Christ and Christ alone because he is both fully God and fully man. That's why Ashley and I sang that song earlier today. The words fit right into this point of the sermon. Within Christ is eternal life. It is core to his being. And this life is light shining the way to salvation. But we should admit that there are other people that God has powerfully worked through before Christ, during his ministry on earth, and, and after Christ. How should we understand them? What makes them different? Look at verses 6 and 7. They say there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. See, there's been a progression so far in these first few verses. From all of creation, John has moved to all of humanity. And from all of humanity, now he just moves to a single person. Here we are introduced to John the Baptist. The first two words, there was, comes from a verb meaning to come into being. John's sole purpose, the sole reason he came was to be a witness. He came into being to be a witness. Verse 6 makes clear two things about John. One, he was a man. And two, he was not, as Jesus is, God. John was created. Jesus was not. John was temporary. Jesus was eternal. John's purpose was to point to Jesus. That's why he was sent from God. And verse 7 reveals three characteristics about John's purpose. First, he was not the light. You know, if we were to follow John's example, if we are going to be an effective witness for Jesus, we should start with the same realization. We are not the light. We are not Christ. We are not the central figure. Jesus is. 
our role as a witness, and also John the Baptist's role as a witness, is one of humility. We are not the center of attention. Jesus is. The second characteristic is that he was sent to bear witness about the light. Now the word witness is a legal term in the Greek, and it points to the uh, uh, verbal testimony rendered in a court of law. That means for us to engage in witnessing to someone else, we have to verbally speak about Christ. See, the words must be backed up by our lives. Living a, living a life of Christian integrity, though, isn't evangelism. It's more like a pre-evangelism. It's essential for an effective witness, but witnessing must cross the threshold into spoken words to be considered evangelism. The last characteristic about John in verse 7, for his purpose is that he was sent so that all might believe through him. That was the expectation of the response to his witnessing. He didn't witness for the sake of witnessing, just like we don't do it for the sake of doing it. We witness so that others might believe in Jesus. And so the role of the witness is vital. If, um, it is vital because uh, witnesses are required to establish the truthfulness of facts. We must testify truthfully to what we know, no more, no less. Now what, we'll, uh, what that will do in our evangelism efforts is one of two things, and we see them both in John. See, John prepared the way for Jesus. That's why he was sent. Just like John, our witnessing may only be preparing the way for Christ to shine a light into someone's light, life. If we understand this in terms of planting a seed into soil, sometimes we need to prepare that soil so that when the seed is planted, it will grow. But John also proclaimed Jesus, as we'll soon see. He planted seeds that grew and produced a harvest. That is the other purpose that we might be called to in our witnessing. Believers either prepare the way or proclaim. It's our third point for today. Believers either prepare the way or proclaim. Every person through which God has worked throughout history has only ever pointed to Christ. In the Old Testament, they pointed forward to Christ. They had faith that God would bring about salvation and would make everything right, and that was enough for them. During Jesus' life, his contemporaries pointed to him. They witnessed salvation being filled. And since Jesus ascended into heaven, every believer has pointed back to his work on the cross. Even the greatest man is not on the level of Jesus. Jesus is both God and man. Believers either prepare the way for others to uh, believe and affirm this, or we proclaim the truth of who Jesus is. Now, right now, you are in a network of relationships. You have family, friends, co-workers, acquaintances, and others that you interact with on a fairly regular basis. And don't forget about your one more person. By living a, a life of Christian integrity, you are preparing the way for proclamation to occur. You are helping the soil to be fertile and receptive. But living a Christian life isn't evangelism in itself. Evangelism, witnessing, proclamation, one thing that they all have in common is that they are spoken. We have to actually speak to share the gospel. And the thing is, the call in our life is to do both. We should prepare the way and we should proclaim and it takes discernment to know when to do both. But we do this because of the reality that we're confronted with. The knowledge that we have about who, God, uh, who Jesus is and what he has done is so life-altering that we cannot possibly keep it to ourselves. We need to share it with others. Was Jesus just a man? No. He was more than that. He is God. That's our big idea for today. Jesus is more than a man. He is God. Jesus is more than a man. He is God. It's a simple truth. It's a foundational truth. But it's one that we must all affirm. We saw this throughout the passage today. Jesus is God. He is eternal and he is the creator. Because of that, salvation is found in Christ alone. Jesus is life and light. And he is not overcome or understood by the darkness. He overcomes the darkness by his sacrifice and resurrection. 
and believers either prepare the way or proclaim. Just like John was sent from God and was a witness pointing to Christ, so too are we sent from Christ, and so too do we point to him. All of this stems from this solid truth and reality. Jesus is more than a man. He is God. And so, Jesus asked his disciples the same question that I asked you at the beginning. Who do you say that I am? Their first response was to point to great men in their past. They said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. The application for today is written out on your note paper. So I'm just going to simply close with this. I can teach you the Bible like I, what, it, what it says like I always do. I can teach you theology and doctrine like I always do. But only you can answer this question for yourselves. And your answer will reveal whether you trust in what God says or if you decide to trust in yourself. Who do you say that Jesus is? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we could come before you and and praise you and worship you, and that we could look into your word. Lord, I hope that as we've looked into uh, uh, the beginning of the Gospel of John, that we've seen just the biblical support that Jesus is man and Jesus is God. And that through him, Lord, that we can have life and and, um, a relationship with you. So, Lord, help us to affirm this. Help us to believe it. And I pray that you would convict each person here to surrender uh, their life to you and to surrender more of their lives to you, that we would come before you in in humility, that we would let go of our pride and and our our selfishness, that we would just come before you in, in gratitude and thankfulness and to grow in our relationship with you. Guide each person as we go throughout this week, Lord to just uh, uh, continue to think about these words and to um, uh, meditate on them. I pray this all in your name. Amen.